All right, so we are going to go over uh, cell structure. <clears throat> there are, of course, all living things are made out of cells. Um, so, but we have different types of cell depending on whether you're a single-celled organism, like this one with your on the left, or you're an animal cell, or if you're multicellular, this is a um, a cell in in lung tissue. So there's multiple different cells all combined together. Um, or plant cells also have different structures within them as well. So we're going to go over the different types of cells and what are in them. So first for review, um, a couple questions for you. Who was the first observer of cells? And I'm not going to answer these. I want you either to recall from our other lectures or you can look them up. Uh, and then the second one is who came up with the cell theory? And finally, what is the cell theory? And we're going to kind of expand on what we talked about before. There are essentially three parts to the cell theory. And the first one that I already mentioned is that all living things are made out of cells. And if it is made of cells, it's called an organism. And the processes of metabolism, which is how uh, an organism gets energy, and inheritance uh, found in DNA occurs in the cells. So passing information from one generation to the next or from one cell division to the next occurs within the cells. Cells are also the smallest living thing and the basic units of all living organisms. So even the largest organism in the world still is made of a compilation of cells. And then the third one is that cells come from the division of other cells. Um, and we can see here actually in both of these pictures. The bottom picture, this is the completion of a cytokinesis where a cell goes through mitosis and then splits. We'll talk more about this process later. Um, and you can see here there are a bunch of single-celled bacteria cells and you can see a couple of them are starting to split here. So one cell splits into two cells and then they become two individual cells. So those are the three functions of, or the three main points in the cell theory. So cells are limited in their size by the rate of diffusion. Now we'll cover diffusion in the next lecture, but basically diffusion is the way particles are able to get into and out of a cell without using energy. Um, so you may wonder, well, why, why don't we just have one big cell um, and then that could be the organism. And that's because particles cannot actually get into the middle of the cell as quickly if the cell is too large. So for example, we have two cells here. One is large and one is um, smaller. And diffusion will happen at the same rate in both of these cells. So just by looking at them, you know that, say, this substance is essential for uh, DNA replication. And so it needs to go to the center of the cell. The larger cell, it's going to take a longer time than in the smaller cell. Smaller cell. So there is a limit at which a, the size of the cell can no longer become any bigger. And that's why cells are, are small. There are other things that affect the diffusion rate. Uh, surface area, which is also directed to this, um, is controlled by the size. Temperature, so typically a warmer temperature diffusion rates will be faster. The concentration gradient, so that is really a, the amount of, let's say, this red um, substance, um, the amount of inside compared to the outside, and then distance. So again, relating to the size of the smell cell, a larger cell will diffuse at a slower rate. To illustrate this in your book, we have two cells here. One is 10 times as big as the other. Other than that, they are exactly the same. And this is illustrating the difference between the surface area to volume ratio, which is just determined by dividing the surface area by the volume. The bigger a cell is, the smaller this surface area to volume ratio is. And that means it's just going to take more time for stuff to diffuse into the center of the cell. There is more stuff inside compared to the outside in this larger cell than there is in a smaller cell. So in order to see cells, we of course need to use microscopes. And this increases 
the ability um, to see these small things and increases what's called resolution. And resolution is the ability to detect two objects as separate objects. So, um, you know, you can obviously, you can look at salt and salt crystals and you're able to actually see the difference between two salt crystals or two sugar grains or two sand grains. So our resolution um, of just our eyes is able to see two different things. But the reason why we can't see smells is uh, cells. I keep saying smells. The reason why we can't see cells is because the resolution in our eyes is not good enough. We don't have enough photoreceptors in our eyes to see those small things. But what a microscope does is it increases, it magnifies what we're looking at, and it increases the resolution. And because we went we went over this in the lab, you know some of this already. Uh, there are a couple. There are different types of microscopes. One of them is a compound light microscope. It uses light. Um, it shines underneath what you're looking at. And uh, its resolution is 200 nanometers. So you can uh, see something as small as 200 nanometers. An electron microscope has a much greater resolution. It can see things as small as 2 nanometers. Um, and detect the difference between them. Um, and there are two types of electron mix microscopes which use electrons. They shoot electrons at substances and then measure their absorbance to come up with an image. There's a scanning electron microscope which is used to see the surface of things. And here we have an ant head which um, this image was taken using a scanning electron microscope. And then we have a transmission electron microscope and you're able to actually go more in depth and see things under the surface in a transmission microscope. And so we see here these are actually microtubules found in the cell um, and these are inside the cell. You're able to see things um, that are inside. So there are different types of cells um, pr but all cells have certain characteristics. Um, we have prokaryotes, which do not have a nucleus, and eukaryotes, which do have a nucleus. But both of them have DNA. Their sh their, the shape of their DNA is different, but they all have DNA. All cells have a place where this DNA is concentrated. It's called the nucleoid in prokaryotes, and it's called the nucleus, which is a membrane-bound structure in eukaryotes. All cells have ribosomes, which are necessary for reading the DNA or interpreting the DNA and being able to make it into a functional protein, which will carry out the processes of the cell. All of them have a cytoplasm, which is a watery fluid, but there's also lots of other stuff in the cytoplasm, including uh, in prokaryotes, the DNA, and ribosomes. And all of them have a plasma membrane, which covers the outside of the cell. Okay, those are the basic components which all cells have. Prokaryotes, those without a nucleus, are all single-celled organisms, meaning the whole organism is just one cell. <coughs> and they do not have a nucleus. They do have a nucleoid. And they also have a cell wall which is outside the lipid membrane. And this is made out of a substance called peptidoglycan in bacteria. And it is used to protect the cell. Um, the, the thickness of the cell wall can determine how well a bacteria can survive in, in different conditions. Um, this is different than the cell wall of plants and fungi. It's made of a different substance and it has a different function. Prokaryotes do not have organelles, and we'll go over the different types of organelles when we talk about eukaryotes. But the ribosomes are still essential, and they um, float freely in the cytoplasm. Some of them do contain accessory structures, such as cilia. You can see on this single-celled critter here, it has little hairs, hair-like substances coming off of them. 
and those are cilia which it uses to move. Flagella is are another structure which is like a little tail, tail, um, and they use, also use those to to move. There are two domains in which prokaryotes are uh, members of the archaea and the bacteria, or the eubacteria. Eukaryotes are a lot more complicated, and we're going to spend a lot more time on them. Um, but the biggest thing that they have is a membrane-bound nucleus. Um, and they also have membrane-bound organelles, so organelles that have uh, specialized functions within the cell and um, also are compartmentalized by these membranes. We also have a cytoskeleton, which is a bunch of proteins that run through the cytoplasm and hold things in place. And they have an endomembrane system, so a way of actually compartmentalizing different things within the cell um, throughout the cytoplasm. Um, and that just makes the cell able to specialize in different areas just like a factory would where you would have different um, different people or different parts of the factory specializing on a different function but in the end overall they're tr all trying to make a certain product so probably the um, most distinctive organelle is the nucleus which holds the DNA the DNA in eukaryotes is, are in linear structures called chromosomes, and when they're, they're protein bound to the chromosomes, they are called chromatin. And these are generally linear structures, although when they are being used, they are unfolded and kind of all over the place. But when they are not being used, they are condensed by the proteins into small linear structures. The nucleolus is the place in the nucleus where ribosomes are being synthesized, so that's where um, the DNA is being used to make different types of RNA. Um, while well, making the ribosomal RNA. And then the nuclear envelope uh, or is the, is the membrane of the nucleus and it has two lipid bilayers, um, whereas the whole cell has one lipid bilayer. It has nuclear pores, which control or regulate the passage of substances in and out of the cell, including RNA. Ribosomes are the units, the organelles, made of ribosomal RNA that synthesize proteins, uh, meaning they take messenger RNA and they take transfer RNA and they link amino acids together to make proteins. There are free ribosomes which are in the cytoplasm. All cells have those, especially prokaryotes. And there are also some that are bound on uh, endoplasmic reticulum or rough endoplasmic reticulum as well. So, the endoplasmic reticulum, there are two types. Rough, again, those have uh, ribosomes on them. Um, and so, they are able to make proteins, and then the endoplasmic reticulum is able to put a membrane around that protein and send it off to where it's needed. The smooth endoplas endoplasmic reticulum, depending on the function of the cell, will have different functions. So in muscle cells, it stores calcium. Um, it's also involved in lipid and carb synthesis in uh, fat cells or liver cells. And it's also used to detoxify substances, so if there are toxic byproducts of making a protein. It will bind them and keep them from uh, destroying other parts of the cell. The Golgi apparatus is kind of a funny little um, organelle, and what it does is it makes membranes, it makes, um, yeah, membrane-bound compartments called vesicles to transport proteins or to transport um, harmful substances 
uh, two different parts of the cell or even outside the cell. Okay, and there are two faces. The cyst face is where things come into the Golgi apparatus, and then the trans face is where uh, things leave. Okay, one of the things that is made by the Golgi apparatus are lysosomes. And lysosomes contain enzymes, and enzymes are proteins. So these are synthesized, and that's what we see in this picture here. Synthesized by ribosomes, and then compartmentalized by the endoplasmic reticulum, sent to the Golgi apparatus. Um, then there are changes made within the Golgi apparatus, and then they are uh, made into their own little um, vacuole or vesicle. And uh, they are used then to digest either old or damaged organelles, or food, or other things that need digesting. Okay, perioxisomes are similar. Uh, they are also formed by the endoplasmic, or sorry, the Golgi apparatus. And they have a specialized function. Some of them contain enzymes that convert hydrogen peroxide into water. Hydrogen peroxide is a byproduct of the mitochondria making energy. So, but it is harmful to uh, parts of the cell, so it needs to be uh, controlled. Um, others contain enzymes that oxidate fatty acids. All right, vacuoles are found in plants, and they have are basically membrane-bound structures with a lot of fluid inside, and they help keep the shape of the of the plant cells. So if there isn't enough fluid in the vacuole, the cell will shrivel. If there is lots of fluid in there, then it will keep it um, uh, stiff and firm. Okay. There are different types of vacuoles. Some storage vacuoles will store um, molecules for when they are needed. And then some fungi and protists have contractile vacuoles that also will help change the shape of the cells when needed. The mitochondria, this is the the um, energy machine of the cell. So this is where oxidative phosphorylation takes place. And oxidative phosphorylation is the process by which we use oxygen to make energy. Um, and that's, we're going to go over that in more detail later. But just know that mitochondria are where the energy is, is being formed. It also has a double membrane, just like the nucleus. The inner membrane is just this round, I mean, the outer membrane is just the round membrane that covers the cell. The inner membrane um, folds in and around itself, and then the folds that it makes make these finger-like projections called cristae. Um, and these are important for, again, making energy. Another interesting thing about them is they contain their own DNA. And uh, this DNA is inherited in humans and mammals and most other things through uh, the mother. So the DNA that are in my, my mitochondria match the DNA that are in my mother's. But I don't get any mitochondria from my father. So um, th this is used in genetics a lot to trace then a lineage of of um, mitochondria or to check relatedness between different species based on their mitochondria, the DNA in their mitochondria. Chloroplasts are also uh, similar to mitochondria. They have a double layer, um, but they are only found in photosynthesizing organisms such as plants and cyanobacteria. The pigment that makes them green is called chlorophyll, and it is activated by sunlight. Um, and and helps them to make energy. It also contains two membranes, like I said, and it has its own DNA. It also has its own ribosomes and so the mitochondria. The inner membrane, though, is not called, uh, does not form cristae. Instead, it forms sacs called thylakoids. And then uh, thylakoids, when you stack those on top of each other, those are called granum. A granum of thylakoids is a stack of them. Okay, and again, this is an important for the process of photosynthesis. And this is also what makes plants 
and other um, organisms green. So both mitochondria and chloroplasts are um, thought to have evolved or been incorporated into cells by the process of endosymbiosis, and we talked about this before. But some of the evidence of this is because they have a, a double membrane. So it's thought that once upon a time, um, there was a bacteria that looked like mitochondria, or similar to it, that was engulfed by a larger bacteria. Um, and as it was engulfed, it, it, it used the membrane of the bacteria. And then it already had a membrane, and that's why it has a double mem membrane. Same with chloroplasts. Once upon a time, it, it was its own individual cell that got engulfed by another cell, and then um, eventually became part of that cell. Um, and there's other um, other organelles such as the nucleus that also had the same um, endosymbiotic origin. Okay, the cytoskeleton, if you remember, uh, mentioned this before, and this is a network of proteins that go throughout the cytoplasm, actually throughout the whole cell, and that's what keeps the organelles in place. If you notice, most of the models we have, or that we draw, that we talk about, just have the organelles in certain areas and are not just floating around bumping into each other. Um, it's the cytoskeleton that keeps them together. There are three different types, and they are different sizes. Microfilaments are the smallest, and um, they are composed of this protein called actin, so actin filaments. Um, microtubules are the largest, okay, and there are a few different types of those. And then there are intermediate filaments, which are between the two. Um, a centrosome uh, is found in different parts of the cell. Uh, one of the region is, one of the places is in um, the region around the centrioles. And centrioles are proteins that are important for uh, lining up chromosomes when a cell is dividing. Um, and they also make up flagella and cilia. And so this green, you see there are a bunch of a triplet here and a triplet there. Um, those are made of microtubules. And that's what a cent uh, centriole is composed of. Um, you put these together make these rod shaped um, proteins and uh, that's what a flagella is made out of. Plants and fungi lack centrioles, so you're only going to find these in, in animals. Alright, cell walls are only found, uh, again, in plants. Okay, they're also found, there's a different type of cell wall found in, in bacteria. But cell walls are found in plants and also in some fungi, some protists have it as well. In plants and protists, it's made of cellulose, which is an indigestible, well, it's not digestible by us, um, carbohydrate that gives plants their stiffness. In fungi, though, it's not made of cellulose, it's made of chitin. Alright, the extracellular matrix, this is found on the outside of the cell, so extra meaning outside, cellular, of course, referring to the cell. Um, and this is uh, a bunch of different types of molecules, macromolecules, that exist on the outside of the cell. Some of them are glycoproteins, which is uh, sugar and protein combined. Also has elements of collagen, which is a, a protein. And what it does is it performs, forms a protective layer outside the cell, so that the cell is not just totally exposed to whatever is around it, but it has these glycoproteins to protect it. This is a scanning electron microscope of a cell with a very thick um, extracellular matrix. Here's another cell that has a very long and uh, 
complex intertwined extracellular matrix. Okay, so we notice there are some fundamental differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And I wanted you to note the ones that are circled here. So first, a cell wall is present in prokaryotes um, and in plants, but animals do not have a cell wall. Again, a nucleus is not found in a prokaryote, but you do have them in plants and animals because these are both eukaryotes. Chloroplasts are only found in plant cells not in prokaryotes or animals. And the chromosomes in prokaryotes are uh, is a big circle of DNA, whereas in animals and plants, which are eukaryotes, it is um, they have multiple chromosomes and they are uh, linear. Okay, so we're going to briefly talk about some cell-to-cell -cell interactions. Um, we mentioned glycoproteins. Those are sometimes used to recognize different cells. So you have different cells floating through your body, um, interacting with each other, and they need to know. Um, they need to be able to identify each other um, for functional purposes, and also to know whether they are an invading pathogen or not. So, in addition to glycoproteins, sometimes there are glycolipids which are made out of, of course, lipids, and then the glyco refers to a, a, the sugar part. The lipid, lipid part is embedded within the lipid bilayer. Um, there are also um, proteins called MHC proteins that are used to identify whether something is, is a foreign pathogen or not. <coughs> Um, in multicellular organisms, you also have cells that need to be connected to each other, and they're either connected in one of three ways. One is a tight junction, and that forms a waterproof barrier between two cells. And that's this one up here. The second one is called desmosomes, and this is a more uh, a very strong connection between two cells. Act like uh, rivets that are very strong and, and keep two cells together. This is especially important for cells that experience a lot of trauma or repetitive force, such as cardiac cells or cells of your heart. Your heart is constantly beating, so it needs to be tied together very tightly. Um, and then in animal cells, you have gap junctions. In plant cells, you have plasmodesmata. And these allow cells to communicate between each other. So it allows signals or molecules, signaling molecules, to pass between two cells so that they can, again, um, communicate to each other. Uh, the most common example of this in, um, in animals would be the nervous, uh, nervous tissue that needs to communicate to different cells. It will do that through gap junctions. All right, and then this last picture is of a plasmodesmata. Um, this is the cell wall separating two cells and um, it's actually made of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which spans the uh, cell wall of the two and is able to connect them so that molecules can be sent between them. All right, and that is all for our uh, cell and cell functions.